in a session dedicated on the truths and myths of renal denervation in Europe ECR 2019, we have the opportunity to discuss uh, many issues related to the renal denervation procedures. The starting point was the fact that now we have solid evidence that renal denervation works. Three recent randomized control, some control trials, the Spiral Project and the Radiant Solo Study, achieved similar reduction in ambulatory systolic blood pressure that was clinically relevant. Based on these findings, we discuss and enlighten some myths and truths related to renal denervation. It is a myth that uh, the renal nerves uh, go throughout uh, the length uh, of uh, the uh, adventitia of the renal artery. It is uh, very important to know that in the first third of the renal artery there are uh, many uh, ganglia that occupy the first third of the renal artery. This ganglia has a lot of uh, innervation uh, that goes not only uh, to the kidney but also to other organs, so there is no nerves uh, at this point. From this ganglia, uh, um, there are uh, some uh, nerves that go uh, distally through uh, bundles. There are a lot of uh, cases where nerves does uh, not uh, pass through the renal artery. Instead of that, they go, they bypass the renal artery and then they get uh, to the kidney very distally, uh, maybe uh, through the uh, anterior or posterior division of the renal artery. So they are late arriving nerves. And finally, there are uh, uh, maybe 30 to 40 percent of the cases that uh, they uh, people has more than one artery so not only the main renal artery who is the biggest artery so we have to uh, denervate also this uh, this these small arteries it's a myth that safe safe and successful renal denervation simply comes down to measuring depth the reality is the re renal denervation lesion is complex. It's irregular, it doesn't have a uniform shape. We must, must measure several aspects of it to really understand the completeness of ablation. And I think more likely what's important is the volume and distribution of that lesion we create. And of course, how many nerves are encompassed in the area of the RF ablation. It is a myth that patients with isolated systolic hypertension should not get renal denervation. Very often, isolated systolic hypertension is thought as equivalent to severe irreversible vascular stiffness, but newer data suggests that there is a, um, a relevant sub-cohort of patients with isolated systolic hypertension in whom not vascular stiffness is the main problem, but other problems, and they are very much amenable to the mechanisms of renal denervation, meaning reduction in sympathetic drive and newer analysis actually showing that they, these patients can benefit as, at least as much as those with combined hypertension. That's a myth because renal denervation can affect either afferent nerves, which we study, but also efferent nerves to the kidney and that depends on whether there's pre-existing kidney disease where the afferents might be important or there may not be kidney disease so they may not be important. So that depends on, on the patient. So at the present time, denervation will always lower blood pressure whether it's denervating afferent nerves or not. So it's effective, clinically relevant and then we'll do further research to be able to target more effectively one or the other under certain conditions. But for now, denervation is an effective therapy whether the afferents are involved or not. The last myth that was enlightened in the today's session was how to quantify the efficacy of renal denervation. Now we have evidence that the best way to quantify the efficacy of renal denervation is to take into account many parameters, not only the location of the lesion, not only the depth of the lesion, but also the surrounding issues in order to discuss in a better way for the efficacy of renal denervation to use more appropriate terms like the uh, lesion area or the lesion volume.